Welcome to the Carriage Works Masterclass. I'm Kylie Javier Ashton, and today we are cooking in the state of the art Smeg Kitchen with my good friend, Luke Powell, who is the chef and owner of LP's Quality Meat um, and Bella Bruda Pizza in Sydney. Today we're going to be talking about all things salty, which I think is my favourite flavour. Yeah, 100%. It's, um, it's a very good flavour and also just a good um, tool to, to use in the kitchen. And you're going to be taking us through a few recipes? Yep, so we're going to do a, a pork, chicken liver and green peppercorn terrine, a wagyu corned beef and a nougat parfait with salted honey caramel. Cool, well, should we get started? Yep, let's do it. Nice. Okay, so we're going to start off with making a terrine, is yep, that right? That's right, yep. Um, and what have we got here? So we have some pork shoulder, um, some pork jowl, uh, chicken livers, egg whites, uh, two types of salt, so a curing salt and uh, a flaky salt, mm -hmm. eschalots, green peppercorns, uh, port, uh, parsley, and then just some golden beetroots and dill. Amazing. Okay, so first of all, we're just gonna dice up the, the meats. So the shoulder, we just need to cut it to the size of our mincing attachment, which we'll set up shortly. Okay. And it doesn't have to be perfect or anything. If the if we come across any things like bone or sinews, we can we can trim them out. It's obviously not very nice to eat in the in the finished product. Now with terrines, like I guess they kind of seem complicated, but that's, are they? That's the thing. Like when when I was younger, I always thought it was a very intimidating um, preparation, and I guess once you once you've shown how to do it and understand what's going on, it's actually not that not that complicated. And it's like a wonderful vehicle for flavors. Like you can really change and add things how you want. Um, I'm always like a bit more, the simpler the better kind of thing. Yeah. And with the, the seasoning of it, it's quite heavy on the salt. Um, and then it also gets a small amount of curing salt um, in the mix. And that sort of gives it the wonderful pink hue, um, but then also helps keep its shelf life a bit longer. Well, I think that that's also the really cool thing about salt is that not only is it a flavor, but it, you know, like it's used for so many different techniques of preservation, of fermentation. Yep. Like it's such a vehicle for, I don't know, for cooking. That's and, right, yep. yeah. And, and so many different foods rely on it so much, like every culture sort of uses salt. Yep. Um, yeah, primarily in the cooking, like everyone uses it. So this is cured as well, is it? Uh, so essentially, um, well, I mean, technically it is, a, it is a cured product once we add the curing salt to it. Um, and yeah, with the, with the, another amazing thing about salt, salt always finds equilibrium, which I love this word. So whenever we add salt to, to something, eventually, um, the levels of salt will become equal throughout the, throughout the dish because it's always sort of balancing itself out. Awesome. So we've got these chicken livers. Yep. So we won't pass these through the mincer, but we might just give them a little cut because I quite like it in the in terrine when you cut through um, you get a nice sort of uh, definition sort of mosaic yep. looking looking terrine you can put everything through the mincer if you want to but all the pieces sort of become a uniform shape um, you can hear these are a, a little bit frozen and that's not such a bad thing like when you're making terrines or any sort of sausage products it's quite important to keep all the ingredients cold right. um, and you'll see once we start mixing it uh, that that comes into a an important step to keep everything as cold as possible. And I guess like having the, the livers whole kind of gives it a little bit more texture. Is that yeah, right? When, so when you have the terrine. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay. So those are meats. I'm just going to put them back in the fridge while we um, get the other things ready. Cool. I can do that for you. And now we're just going to cut the echelots and some parsley. Yes. Okay. So these guys, you can pass the um, the echelots through the mincer if you want to, but they do end up a bit chunky and it's not a problem. I just prefer to give them a little cut. But if you don't have these amazing knife skills, <laughs> you can, then you can pop them in the mincer. Perhaps the mincer would be, I mean, that'd be my move. I mean, sure. we can we can put the parsley through the mincer. Let's, let's do that. All right, cool. Awesome. And I mean, where did your love of meat and terrain come from? So, I mean, as you know, we always worked in the fine dining restaurants. Yep. And I um, always wanted to open something, a restaurant, and I thought maybe just go for one last sort of internship or stage overseas and 
I went to Blue Hill at Stone Barns, which is upstate New York. Yep. Dan Barber's the chef there. And um, they were very friendly and because we'd come from Tets, they were just like, if there's anything you want to know while you're here, just let us know and we'll, we'll show you. And they were pulling pigs off the farm and sending them to the wow. abattoir and come back. And then this guy would just break them down. They'd turn them into charcuterie and sausages. And I was like, can, can you show me all this? Because like I'd, <laughs> I'd, never, I'd never done um, yeah, any butchery like, like butchery. that before. Yeah, so. Awesome. So then we're going to pass the parsley. You're not going to yeah, chop we, that up. We can, we can put it through the mincer. Um, and you know, just, just, just to kind of show, you can go as sort of refined as you want and, and, and then as rustic as you want. And I don't think there's, there's, um, there's not a right way with the terrines. And I mean, you can, you can make quite a sort of rustic country style or can you see like some of these guys make these masterpieces of pâté en croûtes with the, yeah. the terrine and the pastry on the outside. Like it's, it's wild. And this through the, through the mincer attachment. Oh, there we go. All right, brilliant. All right, let's see how we go. Are there different grinds, like different thicknesses? Yeah, so you can change the, the plate, so the, the plate's a little, the little die on the, on the mincer and you can make it coarse or fine. For this guy, we'll make it kind of, this is the coarsest, coarsest okay. one. You want it and this is good. Yeah, chunky, chunky. So we get the nice, the nice uh, terrazzo of the pork. Terrazzo. Yeah. Nice. Fancy. Very fancy. Rustic terrazzo terrine. Yep. <laughs> and with this now, you see it's coming out of the mincer quite nicely, like it's cutting cutting well. Yep. Um, one, probably because the mincer's good, but also the the meat's cold. So if it's if it warms up too much, it does start to smear and you get these like margarine like kind of like Is it because the fat starts to soften? Up, melt, melt, yeah. And it so, would heat up in here too, yep, right? That's right, yeah, yeah. So that's why we sort of put it in the fridge first is to try and get it as cold as possible. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that. We'll just run the parsley through. So to instead of cutting it, we're just going to mix it with a little bit of meat in the top. And then we can run it through the mincer. Because it will it not go through by itself? I don't think so. Like we'll try and put it through, but if I just put a bit of meat behind it, then it will <laughs> help it, help it nice. go through. Ah, little hack. Little, little tricks. Now again, you can add as, as much or as little as you want um, of the parsley, and then you can start adding other herbs in as well if you want thyme and... All right, that's good. Great. All right, so that's good. So parsley mint's done. Well, actually, we'll get all our ingredients ready. So we've got the, the eschalots, the peppercorns, um, the egg whites, port, and then our two salts. Mm -hmm. and then pepper. So just for the first bit, I'm going to put the terrine into the, well, the mix into the, into the mixer. And then we're going to, what we'll do, we actually we'll grab a set of scales and just measure it out so we can work out how much salt to add. Okay, yep. so do you do that by weight? Is yes. that right? Yep. I'll so grab I that for you. I think it's 15 you. grams per kilo. All right. Because that's the interesting thing about brining and it's all done by weight. Yeah, weight and, and percentages, um, right. a lot of it. And then that's it. If you've got your sort of base <clears throat> levels of salt, then you can um, yeah, tweak and scale up the recipe how, however you want. So I'll put this mix in here first. And what's going to happen, the reason I was talking about the, the cold before, a really interesting thing happens when you mix meat with salt um, between zero and four degrees and you get a, a, a protein come out of the meat called myosin. And myosin is um, a protein, but it helps the meat bind together and become all sticky. Right. So if you've ever made meatballs at home and it starts sticking to your hand, that's myosin extraction. And what that helps with, with terrines or sausages, you just get that nice tight snap with a sausage or you know tight ah. bind on the, on, the, on the product. So we, we want that. The livers are gonna go in, yeah. Look, yep. All in here? Yes, please, yep. Great, okay, so what have we got? Two, four, eight, six. See, so this looks like a lot of salt, but we've actually got quite a, what is that? 37 and a half, yeah. 37.5. Yep. Okay. Okay, that's good. And then I'm just going to tear this. So then this curing salt as well, and you can get this online. Like probably if you ask your butcher for it, you can get it. You don't have to put it in, but it's going to give it that nice sort of pink hue. If we cook it without it, it'd go quite gray. Um, and then also helps with the, with the shelf life 
Um, so what is in that? So sodium nitrate, so this is a bit of a, a, a bone of contention. Um, there's lots of information about it. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a naturally occurring thing. You've got it in your saliva, your body's made to metabolize it. People sort of get 80% of it in their diets, not from sausages or frankfurters, but actually from vegetables. It's in, it's in a lot of veg. Um, but it's in a lot of pork products as well, is that right? Yes, they use it a lot in meat processing. Um, to give it that pink hue. Give it so that pink hue, that. and then, but also as like a, um, antibacterial like to mostly prevent botulism which is the um yeah it's like a nerve toxin very very poisonous right okay uh so we're just going to add one gram per kilo of finished products so we've got uh, two, two, two and a, yeah 2.5 so we're gonna add about 2.4 grams of, of the curing salt to this salt okay and then we're gonna start mixing now this might get a little bit gnarly, so we might have to be careful when we, <laughs> when we mix so we don't end up covered in meat. So I'm just going to put that in. That's okay, because I'm camouflaged. Oh, yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to turn that on? Yep, go for it. Okay, we're good. Alright. So let me go back a little bit, is that going to lower? So when we're mixing now, you can see that um, it'll all start coming together. And yeah. then, like I said, between zero and four degrees, with the addition of the salt, we're going to start to get that myosin extraction. Okay. So we'll wait for that to happen, and then we can start adding our, our other ingredients. So you're going to start, it's going to start to get sticky, is that yeah. right? Yeah, yep. And we can, we can give it a little feel. So if we stop it now, and then start to, I mean, that's, that's definitely already, already happening. So we're starting to get this like, oh, cool. patty cake kind of texture, which yep. is good. So we might just put on a little bit more. Yep, turn it back on. Alrighty, so now we can start adding our other ingredients. So we've got the, the chopped echelots. Yep. So maybe maybe turn it off just in case they go over there. <laughs> Smart. Yeah. Thinking, cooking, You've thinking. You've done this before. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. I obviously haven't. <laughs> All right. And peppercorns. I mean, so we, green we can, peppercorns. Green peppercorns. So these are peppercorns, and obviously peppercorns are a berry. They grow at sort of. Um, you can get them at different stages when they're when they're ah. when they're black and dried. They're sort of dried, and these are, these are then fresh. So these are actually being um, canned and brined. So another another salty component. Okay. Um, yeah, just just preserved in in, in, a, in a salt water, and um, they're quite fresh and quite crunchy. Like it's a good texture, and yeah, I guess when you if you're going to add them to this, they are it is going to be cooked again. So it's quite important if you can find them. Um, peppercorns that are crunchy at this stage because sometimes when they come out of a can or a jar they're a little bit mushy and they go okay. extra mushy when it's cooked so if you can find them when they're crunchy yep that's that's a good good thing nice okay so maybe we'll let's just add these in looks good and on again yep oh. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so while this is mixing now, we've got one more component to go in, so egg whites. Okay. So egg whites are just gonna soften the texture of the terrine a little bit and then just help with the setting. So while this is going, we're just gonna gently- So you keep it on and then slowly add? Just slowly add them, yeah. So that's 230 grams, so we'll just add sort of one at a time if we can. And just the whites? Just the whites, yeah. And that helps bind it all together? Yeah, yeah, and, and then yeah, just also makes it a little bit softer. If you sort of do a terrine with all straight up, meat it's quite um firm what does the port do so port just adding alcohol to it it's, it's like a nice flavor port it's quite does it give it a richness yeah yep yeah. all the alcohol is gonna get cooked off but it's just a nice a nice seasoning and does it matter like does, does it need to be a fortified wine or is uh, any kind of yeah any alcohol you can, you can put red wine cognac um madeira i mean i guess those kind of sweeter yeah. Things do do lend itself quite well. And something with a little bit of richness to it and body yep. will kind of help pull all the meaty components together, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So a little. Okay, do this little crank up. Okay, now I've just put off a little bowl of water because this is going to help us packing the terrine mix into the mold. Now, a funny thing is that the terrines itself. This is actually called the terrine. So in, okay. in the olden times, terrines were referred to the, the vessel, not the actual mix. Um, 
And to put this in here, so I'm just going to wet my hand first, and this just stops the mix sticking to my hand so much. Right. If I sort of whack my hand in there, it, it becomes very sticky and gets quite messy. And then to get this in here, we want as minimal air bubbles as possible. Got it. So it looks a little bit aggressive, but I'm just going to slam that into the, into, the, <laughs> into the mix. And then so if you see there, I'm just going to go across and cover the whole bottom. Yep. And then we'll just build it up. Build and it up then from you there. keep on going. Yeah. So this is what you do for your anger management. Yes. So then we're just going to put it in there like that. And then I'm just going to th keep throwing these little handfuls of mix all in the, in the bottom. I love the technique. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Like, wouldn't be like a, how you would think it would normally be. No, I don't know. I think I would just, the... I don't know how, I think you'd just kind of bang bash it. it. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could bash it on the, on the, on the bench. I just feel like if you put it in bit by bit, you're more inclined to get the, the air bubbles down. Yep. And if you sort of chuck it all in one big lump, there's probably going to be air somewhere in there. Yeah. Now this bit here, so I'm just going to wet my hand again and then just smooth out the top because we've sort of got a lot of, spaces in there yeah and the water just helps to you can see it's just sort of goes a bit more smooth okay nice right so now we've got a, a tray to put the terrine in so now we're going to cook it so we put it in here and then i've got the oven set at 185 and it has to go in there for about half an hour first just to okay. just to brown the top you don't have to do that, but it's nice if you get a sort of brown brown top on top. And then after half an hour, we're going to fill this up the sides uh, about halfway with water and then cook it. It's going to take about maybe three hours for that size. Um, and then we're just going to check the internal temperature with a thermometer. And when it's um, 75 inside, it's done. So we'll just chuck it in. Perfect. All good. Okay, now the little garnish we're going to serve with the with the terrine. Um, this is another cool. Uh, is that just the yeah the dill and the, the beets? Another little cool effect from from salt. Um, we're going to ferment these these beetroots um, to go with the to go with the terrine. So lacto fermenting. Um, you can basically take any, any well, a lot of a lot of different things, vegetables or um, even I was just thinking meat. So even salami is lacto fermented. Um, but we are basically going to cover it with like a 3% salt brine yep. and then that sort of inhibits all the um, bad bacteria from growing but it sort of promotes um, lactic acid producing bacteria to grow. They, they thrive in that, in that sort of 3% salt range. Um, and once, once we cover the beetroots in the, in the salt brine, we, we can leave it for a week to two weeks um, and it's really up to you how, how far you want to push it. It's amazing how salt can transform things, right? Yeah. Um, and pres preserving is like a huge totally. part of what salt has done through history. Yep. Okay, cool. We're just going to put these into a bowl and then make it a little um, a salt brine. So 3%. So I need to weigh this first so we get the total amount of... It's all about the weight when the weight. it comes with the salt. Yep. Okay. Beets we'll put in here. There's going to be another maths question, Kylie. Oh, no. Ready? Okay, 3%, you said? Yep. Oh. I think we're going to have to use a calculator for this one. Okay, so beets in. I'm just going to cover them with enough water. So that's, that's going to be our, our total weight. So you're calculating it with water, yep. not just the beets? Yep, with the, with the water. I'm okay. actually going to tip some out so we've got 400 to make it a nice, nice. round number. So let's take these beetroots out. We've yep. got our water. And we're just going to add 12 grams uh, of salt. Directly to the Directly to, to the this. Wall. Okay, cool. And then we're just going to give it a little heat up so we can dissolve the salt. You, you might be able to do this if you just continually whisked. I but, see. But just to make sure. And you're not take you take out the beets so that they don't cook when you heat it up. Exactly. Right? Yep. Okay, twelve. There we go. So I'm just gonna put this on here and give it a little heat through. I guess we don't want to have it rapidly boiling, so we're evaporating all the water. We just want to just heat it enough, just so it um. Just so you get. It melts the salt. Dissolve. Yep. And at this point, we can actually add anything we want to, to the pickle. So again, your imagination, we, we use these beets because they're at the, at the markets. Um, and in the ferment, you can add peppercorns, nice. garlic, herbs, dill, dill stalks. Um, whatever. Whatever, whatever, and it, and it works. Um, 
and, and again, once it sort of starts fermenting, it's 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 preserved, so you can okay. keep it you can keep it for a very very long time after it's um, fermented. Nice. So normally I would just cover this with the brine, mm -hmm. and then you need to find yourself like a little vessel at home if you've got any old jars or um, yeah, I mean anything that's sort of I guess you want to cover it because you don't want anything weird falling in there. Yeah. And then when you do the um, when you do the the lid, don't don't tighten it up too tight because being fermenting, it's it's making a sort of carbon dioxide, so it can go right. bang. Or when you open it, you're going to get covered in pickle juice. I see. <laughs> so that's it. So that once once we do that, we can just sort of put it to the side and find yourself a vessel and then leave it for one to two weeks, and you'll definitely notice a, a big change. With the lid slightly ajar. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So here's the, uh, the the TV swap out. Mm -hmm. We've got um, some beetroots that I have pickled about a week ago. So these ones have actually lost their colour. I don't oh, know wow. if this is going to happen, but they've, got, they've gone quite white. Um, but if we crazy. eat one, you can, you can eat one now. So it's still quite crunchy. Mm. And there is like a, a tang a, a tang there. Mm. So these have only been a week, so you probably could leave them another week. I mean, you can leave them indefinitely. And they will get to a point where it sort of stops getting so acidic. But, I mean, I think it's quite delicious. Mm. I mean, you can taste the saltiness still. Yeah. But it's still super fresh. Yep. And so I, I was thinking for the turing, we can use it as a garnish. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you look at this liquid, it's sort of gone a bit cloudy as well, which is normal. And that, that generally happens with the, the lacto-fermented things. So I'll put this aside. And then these guys, I'm just going to slice up quite fine. Almost like a beetroot kind of. Oh, nice. I can't believe they've, they're so white. I know. All the, all the colors just gone into the into the liquid. Well, I guess that's what happens with salt, right? It draws all the moisture out of yep. whatever you're using, yep. but it's still weird that I know, you these off with guys so vibrant. turned into that. So I think if these went a bit further, they would be like quite quite acidic, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to add anything to them, just maybe some dill yep. as we put it into the, into the um, ferment. Chop this quite rough. And that just gives it a little bit of freshness. Yeah, yeah. And I think like things like the fermented pickles, like Always in the sort of like kosher delis, you've got the the, the dilly pickles, mm -hmm. um, and that's it, I think the the lacto ferment and dill goes quite well together. And then I'm just going to put uh, almost like dresser, I guess, with a little bit of pepper and then just some olive oil. I'll put the pepper in. How many twists? Just a oh, couple. Yep. Well, it looks looks good. Oh, yep, perfect. And give a little glug of oil. We don't need to add any acid because that's all in the. In the ferment. And you don't need to add salt because it's already salty? Yep. And I'm just going to grab a terrine out that uh, I've got a cold one in the, okay. in the fridge. But just to get this out. Okay. And then you just pour off the juice once it's once come Once it out, comes out of the oven. Out yep. of the oven, allow yep. it to cool down yes. yep. to room temp? Uh, yeah, to room temp and then it needs to go in the fridge. Okay. Yeah, so I guess you don't want to put the big hot steaming terrine straight in your fridge. Yep. But yeah. I'll just cut the end off. Usually when I cut the end off, I always taste it, just to see what it's like. That's like the best bit, right? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, as a serving size, you can do whatever you feel. Yep. All right, so put that on there. So you can see a little cross section there, mm -hmm. all, the, all the bits. We've got peppercorns, livers, um, chunks of fat from the, from the jowl. Um, and then, like I said, that nice sort of golden top from the half an hour roast at the beginning. Um, but that's pretty good. Yum. Okay, so we've we'll just got a little fermented beets. It actually looks like celeriac, doesn't it? Yeah, it does actually. Okay, let's put that on the side. And I mean, with the terrines, you can eat anything. Like, obviously, mustard's very, very good. Oh, yeah. Um, and any of the, the cornichons, pickled, um, yeah, pickled onions, all that sort of stuff is, is really good because it's quite a fatty. A fatty dish, so if you've got something that's kind acidic of and cutting, yeah, yeah, it, it makes it really good. But that's it. Yum. Should we have a little taste? Yeah. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Drink. Not too salty, is it? Mm -mm. A lot of salt, but. I took way too big a mouthful. Yeah, no, it was gonna <laughs> chew, chew for too long. You get the little pops of peppercorn, mm -hmm. and the, the pickles are like. Super crunchy and really yeah. fresh too. Yep. Um, but really balancing out that salt, considering there's salt in that too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Everything's got 
quite a bit of salt. That's delicious. That's so good. Cool. I mean, it's really good to see all the sort of levels and layers of like what the salt brings to this dish, but that's awesome. Um, so this is our starter. Yeah, that's it. What's next in the dinner party of <laughs> You're Luke? You're not, not going to sit around eating terrines? <laughs> well, you know, that'd be nice, but I want to eat some more other stuff. Okay. Uh, so next we better get cracking with the, the Wagyu corned beef. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Should we do? Yep. So we've got the, the Wagyu Girellos here. So Girello is um, the Italian name for, for an eye round. So it comes off the, off the underneath top side on the, on the back leg of the, the cow. Um, usually this is like quite a lean uh, cut, but because it's Wagyu, it's got a slight amount of marbling through it. They usually turn it into brizzola, um, but it makes a really good, good cut for corned beef. Um, so we've got our beef, we've got a raw one, we've got a corned one. Um, we have salt, sugar, uh, potatoes, um, some anchovies, a little bit of uh, cloves and mustard seed, mm -hmm. and then some herbs, tarragon, parsley, mint, uh, salt, mustard, lemons, carrots, celery, and, uh, and then just some olive oil and vinegar. Awesome. For the, for the corned beef, it needs to be brined. Um, and, you know, talking about the, the salt again, so we're going to immerse the, the, the piece of beef into a, into a salt brine, a salt solution. And what will happen is through the amazing world of osmosis mm -hmm. and, uh, and the salt's going to find its equilibrium by, by soaking into the meat. And eventually, if it's left long enough, the salt levels in the, in the water and the meat will become the same because right. salt always finds equilibrium. Amazing. So we're going to make the brine. We're going to put it in, into, the, into the, the meat into the brine now. So this has to cool down before we put the meat into it. So I have made one earlier, but just to start, I've got a, a liter of water. Yeah. And this is going to become a percentage thing again. So we need to add 5% salt, 1.5% um, sugar. And then with the curing salt, we're going to use this guy again for the, for the corned beef. So corned beef without the curing salt is not going to be pink. It's going to be gray um, and, right. and, and, and arguably it doesn't have the corned beef flavor. So okay. we're going to add 3.7 grams per liter of this for the, for the mix. So first of all, We've got the liter of one liter. That makes it water. the maths easier. I think this round numbers is good today because then we don't have to <laughs> work it out too much. So 50 grams of salt. Just whack a zero on the end. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. And if you take, if we taste this now, it's, it's actually very salty. But by the time it goes into the the meat, it sort of it balances out. Uh, okay, 3.7 grams uh, per liter of curing salt, and you just have to check which curing salt you've got because a lot of them are. A little bit different, so just have to make sure you know which one. Oh, three point seven grams. Yep. Okay. Yep. And raw sugar. So this is just a nice thing. You can use raw sugar, brown sugar, golden syrup, um, just to counter the the salt in the so in the corned beef. Yeah, just a little bit of a little bit of a balance. Okay, we got a little bit of mustard seed and cloves, mm -hmm. and crack a few garlics, bay leaves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we're just going to put that on, just to dissolve the. Mm -hmm. The salt. I'm going to whack these ones in here. And once this comes up to heat and the salt starts to melt, we just got to take it off and let it cool down because we don't want to put it into the put the beef in while it's ripping hot. And you want to we'll start start cooking. start cooking it. Yeah, right. yeah. we want to try and keep it cold. Got it. And here's the cold one. Mhm. Mm now, ideally, you'd want to find something that's got like a a lid, but for now, I'm just going to put it into here. Okay. And then this brine, I'm just going to pour over the over the beef. Right. So this is going to have to sit in the refrigerator for minimum a week oh, right. to two weeks. Um, and during that time, if, it, if there's a bit poking out, I guess if you had a lid on a Tupperware or something like that, it would be good. Yep. You might have to flip it and, and that's quite normal just to redistribute the, the meat into the, into the brine. Um, and during that time, now the salt and the curing salt and all those flavors are going to start to move into the middle. Yeah, right. So it brines the meat. It brines the meat. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so while that's brining, just mm -hmm. before uh, we're going to get the, this piece of corned beef on. Um, so after it comes out of the brine, that's fine. You don't have to, you don't have to rinse it or anything. That's all right. And it's going to be quite salty. So I think once we put it into a pot, um, we're just going to cover it with water. And so you just put it in whole. Yep, put it in whole. Take it straight out of the other brine and yep. put it into a sauce, uh, a pot. Yep, work yep. it into a pot, and then I can start to add a few little 
aromatic things to it. So we'll put some carrots in. Mm -hmm. And these, you can eat them at the end, um, but it's just more for, more for just to flavor the, the liquid as it goes in. Right. Okay, so it's got enough water just to cover it in there. Okay, cool. And then we've got a celery, carrots, um, and then we're just gonna put it on to, to simmer. In the meantime, we're gonna put our potatoes on. Yep. So these kiplers? Yep, little little tiny kipler potatoes. And if you can just pass me that pot over there, please. Yep. And they can go in. And then we're gonna cover these with water as well. Okay. So I'll just fill those up. Um, so with this guy, uh, we're gonna add some salt, but we're gonna add a lot. And Ooh. with with this, I, I love doing this, this um, technique because the, the potatoes themselves inside don't get too salty, but they develop this like white crystally crust on the outside after they're boiled and they're just delicious. Like they're so good as is, but aioli or as we're going to do it in a little bit of salsa verde in them, they're just quite, quite yeah. delicious. But again, it's quite extreme on the, on the salt, but you don't have to be too fearful. And once they come up again, get it cranking and then we'll just turn it down really gently and just, just sort of let them, let them roll along. Awesome. Okay. Salsa verde. So green sauce, salsa verde. Yes. We, We've got tarragon, mm -hmm. um, parsley, and mint. And we're just gonna pick roughly about 40 grams of mint, 40 grams of parsley, and, uh, and about five grams of tarragon. All right. So we can tag team this, we can, we can measure them out. Like I said, this doesn't have to be exact, it's just a good, a good sort of balance of the individual herbs. Tarragon's quite strong, so you don't wanna go too hard on the, on the tarragon train. And I think salsa verde as well is a really good way to use up like herbs, yep, right? Yeah, for sure. If you've got in your That's crisper it. that are going a bit sad, sad before yep. they do. And like I said, they don't, it doesn't have to be exactly this. Like you can put whatever in there. Yeah. Um, any 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 herbs is good. Right, put these guys to the side. Yeah. Now, are you, do you want to chop the herbs? Are you happy doing that? Yeah, sure. Just rough chop. Rough, rough, rough. So just okay. run a knife through, and then you can, I can go. Do a rough. And then afterwards, I can there. just go in that one. Yep. I am going to get these anchovies open. All right, these are so And is good. that for this as well? Yeah. And I think that that's also the cool thing about salt, right? Like you can anchovies that are again just amazing, like salty fish and salt. That's it, and you end up with like something like this is um, is is crazy, and it's not just salty. Like they do have like such a umami kind of veggie mighty flavor yeah um, just from I don't know what well, just just from just from being packed in salt and, and aged it's crazy and I think like that's also the cool thing about different I guess cultures that they season and get that salty flavor through more things than just salt okay and these guys just salted capers so these are capers which is just a little bud of a of a, of a flower and just packed in salt so they, these come in quite a coarse salt so they do have to be rinsed a little bit because they can be a quite um, quite salty yeah so we're just going to soak them in a little bit of water just to draw out some of the the salt and then we can give them a squeeze out so they're not too watery and then just chop them up that's good um, okay yep and then i'm just going to drain these guys so i mean you can soak these for a bit longer if you want to but i mean i quite like the do you do it in warm water or just i just put cold cold it's fine yep and just give them a squeeze just to shake off any excess So I've cut these super fine. I mean, it all doesn't have to be, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be fine, you can do it rough, but just so they're a bit more evenly distributed throughout the sauce. Mm -hmm. The answer is the moment of veggie mites. Yeah, it does have that kind of, it's that umami, isn't it? Yeah. Like, delicious, so good. Okay, now I think we're just missing garlic, so I'll just chop a bit of this up. That goes into the salsa verde as well? Yeah. The next level on there. Yeah, so good. So we'll add olive oil to this now, mm -hmm. and got some. Does it do, does it matter what kind of olive oil or? I mean, I, I love um, I love olive oil, but mm -hmm. I actually don't like it when it's too green because um, I used to think I was allergic to it. It gives me a bit of a tickly throat, ah. but I think it's just the pepperiness, peppery olive oil. So I'm a bit bit of a fan of um, more buttery guys, but the. Yeah, Westerly and the Alto stuff's pretty good. It doesn't doesn't mm -hmm. do it to me. But again, there's a measurement, but you can just sort of add it to the consistency you want. Yep. And then 
Once we add the oil, we'll get it mixing, and then we're just gonna be careful, of course, how much salt we add to it. So we'll just taste it first before we... Right, because you can't, you can't unseason. Can't unseason. Okay, so we can probably crank a few grounds of pepper in there. Alrighty. Nice. Now let's have a little taste, see where we're at before we start adding salt. A bit more. Okay, I think we're good until we add our, uh, our acid. Okay. Right, okay, so I think these potatoes are pretty good now, so Ooh. they're quite tender. Um, I'm just gonna drain them and then I'm gonna leave a little bit of water in the pot so they get this kind of okay. salty, uh, salty thing on them. All right, so chuck those there. And this corned beef now, so I'm just gonna swap these out and I've got one that I had on previously. So this is cooked for about three hours. Okay. Um, and I mean, not much has really changed in the pot by, the, by looking at it, but the, the beef's definitely cooked. And um, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want to serve this hot, hot, hot out of the out of the pot. You want to let it chill out a little bit. Um, so you can just turn off the heat and, and just let it sort of cool down to warm. Uh, so we'll grab this out. It looks like it's shrunk. It has a lot. Okay, so that's your corned beef? That's, that's that corned right? beef. Yeah, that's corned beef. And is there a reason why you chose like Wagyu? Is it for that fattiness? Or? Yeah, I mean, and, and like I said, normally the corned beef cuts a, a top side or, um, or, this, or this eye round. Um, and I think just the, the hint of Wagyu in there just makes it a little bit more fatty. And fancy. And fancy, <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so we've got all our things. So potatoes here, um, salsa verde. Uh, I reckon we can add a bit of uh, red wine vinegar to this now and then I will also add just this touch of lemon juice. So do you want to just... Yep, glug it in. Is that how much do you want to put in here? Well, that's good. It's a little tasty. I think it's good. Yeah. Delicious. Like it's, it tastes, it tastes good. It tastes right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do we got? Ready to roll. Salsa verde, potatoes, lemon, wagyu. Mm. Uh, so we're going to chuck some potatoes in here. Okay. Now we can do this a couple of ways. We can just dress the potatoes, which I think is quite delicious. Um, or we can put big blobs of salsa verde on. I guess all these things just go really nicely together. So it doesn't really matter which way you. Yeah. Because they're all going to end up in the same mouthful, right? In the mouth. <laughs> we're all going to end up in your mouth, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so we'll dollop that on. And then with the spuds. Oh. Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. Mixy, mixy. Big squeeze of lemon juice. Go a bit more. Yum. So good lemon juice. Yeah, it does, hey? That, the rind, the zest. Yeah. Super fresh. Okay, that's good. And. Let's cut this beef. All right. So even if you do a big chunk of beef, it's um, it's not it's such a bad thing because uh, you can have corned beef sandwiches or ri Ooh. ribbons. Okay. And do you eat this hot? Uh, is that a stupid you question? Can, no, you can eat it hot. And like, like I said, you don't really want to eat it ripping hot straight out of the but pot warm. because it, it's it needs to rest as well. It's like a it's like a steak. Like it needs to. Um, do you want to try this? Yeah. It needs to relax, you know, because it's been simmering away. Mhm. Mm and um, it's not overly salty. Mhm. Mm okay. Considering it's been sitting in salt for a week. Yeah. That's crazy. It just, and I think that that's the cool thing about salt. It just ta makes everything taste more intense. So like, it tastes more beefy. Yeah. Because it's been sitting in that salt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't 100%. taste more salty. It just tastes more beefy. It's like when you have chicken that's been brined. It just tastes more chickeny. Yep. Which is there's no there's hardly any uh, downsides. It's just juicy, really mm -hmm. well seasoned, and of course you need some some mustard. Oh yeah.
Good eye. Yum. Right, go for it, Kelly. All right, yes. Get a little bit of everything. Just fun. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. Like the beef, you can really taste that beefiness. Um, and it's interesting, like the texture mm. of corned beef. Like, it, I guess that's what corned beef is all about, yeah. right? Yep. And I think like how much salt we used in the thing. It's quite amazing how how balanced it is. Like, it's not it's not overly mm. aggressive or anything. It's all about that equilibrium. Yep. I love that. Even though I want to keep eating this, I yep. think we need to move on to dessert. Yep. That's what's next, right? Yep. So nougat parfait um, with salted honey caramel. Ooh. Yep. Yum. Should we do it? One more. One more, okay. One more of these. I'll, go, I'll get cracking. <laughs> All right, so on to dessert. Um, what are we having next? Okay, so we're going to do a uh, nougat parfait with salted honey caramel. Uh -huh. um, so we've just got some toasted macadamias here, uh, some cream, uh, some of the carriage works honey, uh, salt, uh, caster sugar, and eggs. Easy. First, we're just going to make the, the praline. Okay. So we just need to get some sugar. Um, so roughly about, praline is good if it's sort of equal, so we'll do about 100 grams of uh, sugar. Now this is a bit of a funny one, I think. Um, People freak out sometimes about caramelizing sugar because it can crystallize and all this sort of stuff. But yep. I think as long as you've got a clean pot and uh, you resist the urge to stir it, then you, you should be okay. But generally, I'm just gonna put a splash of water in here okay. just, just to moisten the sugar to start off. No stirring, did you no say? No stirring, yeah, because I feel like once you start introducing instruments to it, maybe they're dirty. <laughs> and then it's sort of, that, right. that, that's what starts the, I think the crystallization thing starts from having dirty pot or some something in the oh. in, in the mix like something foreign and then okay. it, the sugar crusts around it I uh, see. and then macadamias so once this is um, caramelized we can put a little thermometer in there to work out a temperature mm -hmm. uh, we're just gonna put the macadamias in, fold it through and then we'll just put it onto the onto the tray to cool down and hold macadamias whole like yeah that? yeah you can put them whole I mean we probably could run a knife through them if you wanted but after they get um, coated in caramel they're just gonna go into the blender just to crush it up into like a powder I see. yep okay cool. Cool. While we're waiting, we can just um, separate these eggs. Yep. Um, I'll put that one here. Do you want to do this, Chloe? You can yeah. be the egg, the egg. I can be the egg lady. The egg lady. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yolks in here, and then we'll just put the whites into oh, the Oh, directly in there? Yep. Uh, I'm just going to also measure out the, the caramel. Yep. So we're just going to put honey and sugar into the, into the pot. So for the salted honey caramel, I tend to go like half sugar, half honey because if it's all honey, it's quite intense. It's like, right. it's quite a, um, like it's sickly a little bit. Got it. Yep. Like too intense a flavor. Too intense. So we're just gonna go 100 grams of honey and then just gonna add another 100 grams of sugar. So did you say equal? Equal, yeah. Equal so there's parts. just yep, equal parts. And I'm gonna put a splash of water in this as well, just to help that sugar start melting. All right, so I reckon that color's good. And it's about 150 now. So I'm gonna put the nuts in. And I guess you wanna get it off the heat as quickly as possible because it will continue cooking in right. the pot because it's so, so hot. And then we're just gonna coat these all together. Yum. And then just pour it out on the tray. It smells so good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That, the smell of the caramelization is so good. Yeah. So then this just stays out and it yeah. cools? Yeah, so that needs to cool down. That will set up really rock hard and uh, like a candy. And then we'll just crush it up a little bit and then blend it up in the blender. Okay. So next step, we'll make the caramel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is like, yeah, 100 grams of sugar, 100 grams of honey and we're just gonna put it on kind of to a similar stage as, as this, so around the 150 mark. And then we're gonna stop it caramelizing by adding um, cream. Okay, so while it's going, we can start making the, the parfait. Um, okay. So first thing, if I can ask you please to, we're gonna need a bigger bowl, uh, to blend, uh, sorry, whip the cream. Yeah, whip the cream. Okay, so this is 600. Yep. 
Mills. So you need to whisk it. So you, yeah. You ready? Yeah. And uh, yeah, quite quite stiff peak. So don't don't be too worried about over whipping it. And once we get close, you can yell out. Mate, I'll be here all day. Okay. okay. Easy. <laughs> Okay, and now I'm going to measure out the honey and sugar for the egg white part. So I'm going to put 150 grams of sugar. One of the first recipes that you learned, yes. is that right? Yeah, so my first cooking job, uh, I spoke with this French lady and um, yeah, it was one of her recipes. Yeah, nice. It was very, very like, simple. Okay, and then same again, we're just gonna add a bit of water to, to this guy to get it going. And we're gonna put this on. So now while this is going, we can start the egg whites. Mm -hmm. um, so we just need the whisk attachment. Yeah. And we're gonna take the, the sugar honey mix to about 115 degrees. Okay. And then once the egg whites are whisking, we'll, we'll slowly drizzle it in to make like a kind of Italian meringue. Okay. Um, Sweet. So egg whites. Yep and just go, go start on low. Go for it, yep. Now while this is blending, we're also gonna add a big pinch of salt, mm -hmm. our, our favorite ingredient. And that's just gonna help strengthen the, the meringue. So it is nice, stiff peaks. Yeah, right. So it, it, what helps the proteins in the, in yep. the egg? Coagulate, yep. Okay. And quite on a, on a high speed? Yep. Um, okay, while this is all happening, we might get this guy and start breaking him up a little bit. Okay. So this is going to go in a blender, so it doesn't have to be perfect, but just so we don't. All right, the egg white is going to probably turn off just for a minute. But we're just going to line it first. So I've just got a few layers of cling film. Yep. That are stacked on top of each other. And it's you, you do want to do a couple of layers because um, if you try and pull it out, then the cling film can tear and you won't be able to get it out. So yep. I'm just going to push that into the into the mold. And if it, if you're having trouble, mm. like it's not sticking, you can wet the mold a little bit on the outside, so this is not really sticking. Okay. So what I might do is just flick a bit of water in there. And then just move my little hand around, get it all wet. And then that glad wrap should stick to the edges. Stick to the sides a bit better. So this guy's getting close, so we're at Almost at 135 now with this this guy, but we'll keep going up to about 150. Yep. And then that one's almost there. Yeah, right. this one's sort of still sitting around 110, 108. It's been hovering around so 146. I reckon let's do it. So we'll pull it off and it's going to continue because there's so much residual heat. Yep. I might just move this guy out of the way for a minute. That's 200 there. Okay, so this is going into there, is That's that That's going right? there, yeah, but we'll just wait a minute, just let it cool down slightly. All right, so maybe we can plug the egg whites back in again. Yep. Because we're almost there, so 114. So, shut it on. Now this is going to be a bit careful with this. Yep. Just because it, obviously spinning whisk, you don't want to flick the boiling oh. honey over. Okay. <laughs> I'm stepping so, back. Yeah. So we'll just try and pour it down the edge of the bowl so it's not... So it's not hitting the whisk. Flicking the whisk around. Right. And it will, it will a little bit hit the sides of the bowl, but we'll just try and put it in there. And just slow, slow at the beginning because it's got so much heat. If we pour it on there like straight away, it sort of turns into... Right. Egg white omelettes. Yeah, so you just want to gradually... Yeah. Combine it so it doesn't cook too quickly. Yeah, right. Yeah, yep. but we still need the heat just to kind of fluff them up a lot and then just set the set the eggs a lot. And then you get an even consistency. Yeah. And so this is so hot now. So when we mix everything together, everything needs to be kind of room temp. Uh, so we'll let's let this go, and it can keep whipping, and then also just come down, come down in temperature. Right. Uh, okay. So we'll go back to the caramel. Yep. So this guy now is kind of calmed down, so we're not going to have huge overflow or anything like that. Yep. And then we'll just put the cream in, and if this if this becomes too hard, 
but because the cold cream goes in and kind of sets the sugar, yep. we can just put it back on the heat to soften it all up again and to get okay. it together, just so it's not too... It's, it's too dangerous. If you're just pouring the cream straight in there while it's dripping hot, it just, it's going to go over. Okay. Right, and see, the chunks are just chunks of sugar and honey in there, and they yep. will dissolve, but you might just have to get it in a little heat, but that's a safer thing to do than to, you know, whack it in while it's dripping hot. And then this just keeps on going yep. so until it cools, is that right? Yep. Yep. So this guy now, I can't see any more chunks in there. Like it's got a little bit of foam around the side of the pot, but if I just leave it to the side, I reckon it will all It'll come all together. Dissolve? Yeah, so we'll just put it to the side for a minute and then we'll come back. Okay. Alrighty. So this guy, still really, really hot. What's next? Alright, so macadamia praline. So we're just going to put this, we've broken this up roughly. We're just going to put it into the blender. Oh, that's a tiny thing. That's, that's a, that's a, <laughs> you break your teeth. It's okay. It's my kind okay. of smoothie. Oh yeah. Okay, so there's some fine parts and some chunky parts, but that's okay. I might pull out the big bits and we can just chop them with a knife. Okay. And then... How, like... Ooh. Like and if this you want like well. a crumb, right? Yeah, and I think it's quite nice to have bits of, you know, big bits and small bits, because then it's, again, like a bit of a change in texture. Yeah, so this is kind of how you want it. It's very thick. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not like a... It's very airy, very though. Very airy. Like, I can hear it. It's... Yeah. And that's good for the for the for the parfait. We want it nice and fluffy, and we don't want to try and knock too much. We want to try and keep as much air in there as possible. Okay. With, with both the cream and the egg whites, but we'll do that now. Alright. So I'll grab the cream. We'll grab a spatula and a bowl. Mm -hmm. Now this guy can go into the cream. You can mix those two together. And again, you don't want to be too vigorous, like you want to... So just folding it in? Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to take some of the meringue out and just, I can quite roughly mix it into this part. Mm -hmm. And then I'll fold the rest through just to keep it nice and light. Is that going to be bad? Add the rest in. Okay, so you do it in parts. Yeah. And I feel like now, like it's losing a little bit of volume, but it's yep. sort of coming a bit together, which I don't think is a, a bad thing. Like it's <laughs> looking like it's. It's much more kind of silky though, too, yeah. now, right? Glossy and thoroughly mixed. Oh, nice. Yeah, so you don't want too big air bubbles, but exactly like you said when we did that, we're going to bang it down. Okay. Just to knock out any, any And craziness. is this the same, could you use the same terrine mould? Yeah, you could. Yep. yep. Okay. 100%. Okay. Okay, you can give it a little tap. Get rid of this. Perfect. That was fun. That was good. <laughs> and then we'll just cover it up. And then this is going to go into the freezer. So six to eight hours or ideally overnight is, is good. Yep. And, um, and then it will set and freeze, freeze up. Okay. Okay, let's season this caramel. So okay. we're back with this guy. So it's kind of come together now. Oh yeah, it's thickened There's, up quite a bit. And it doesn't look like, it looks quite together. There's a bit of, so now we're going to make the, put the salt in the salted honey caramel. Mm -hmm. So we'll just go quite a big, pinch even more so nice. and it can take take quite a lot but it just you can improve it significantly and I think even if this was on the slightly saltier side mm -hmm. because the the parfait is quite sweet it's not going to be yeah overbearing you know so that's also something to consider right when you're seasoning like sauces how does that what's it going with what's it going with yeah for sure 
and sometimes that's quite nice if it's if you do have some things that are probably too salty but it's going with something a bit uh, dull then it's it balances out you know and you're not well, eating that almost boring. seasons the other yep. kind of component right yep so since we don't have eight hours or overnight to wait for this parfait i've got one in the freezer very nice Okay, so it's pretty firm, right? It's like if you squish it, you can kind of squash it down. It's not rock hard. Oh, okay. It's not rock hard like the old tub of ice cream that's ice been cream in the back in the of the freezer. freezer. Yeah. Yep. And this is where I, I was mentioning before about the cling film. Okay, why well, you need a few layers. Just to make sure it doesn't rip, because if it rips, then it's ideally a hot knife. And we'll just take a big slice and again however big your portion is can be up to you yep yum probably good if it tempers for a little bit because it will soften up and yep. i mean it's like a it's not icy but it, it is once it tempers it will become quite moussey okay um and then we can just spoon over the salted honey caramel yum Go for it. Mm. The texture is really cool. Like you said, it is even straight out of the freezer. Yeah, it's not too hard. It's quite soft, isn't it? No. Moosey, moosey. It's moosey for sure. I think that like it's so good how all the like flavors kind of come together as well. Yeah. It's and the texture of the nuts. Yeah, it's sweet. It's it's uh, it's definitely salty, but I think yeah, just the salt sort of lifts lifts the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, it combines everything and makes it like this kind of harmonious dish. Mm. Delicious. I think that the thing that I love about salt is that you know, even though it is like the hero ingredient, mm. it makes everything else a hero. Yeah, so for sure. it makes everything else shine um, and taste way better. Yeah, and I think like with the with some of the recipes, like the corning, there's, there's quite specific amounts and same with the lacto-fermenting, but I think if there's, there's rules you can follow, but then also as a seasoning, it's, it's, it's personal taste. You can, you can add as much or as little as you want. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely improves everything. Yeah, well, there's just like a whole world um, to learn about with salt, but I'm so grateful because I think that just going through the recipes with you today and actually thinking about that process has just helped me understand like really how important salt is when it comes yep. to food and making it more delicious. Yeah, brilliant. Sweet. Thank no, you, Luke. Thank you. And thank you for joining us in the Carriage Works Masterclass, brought to you in partnership with Smeg Australia. Can we keep eating? Yeah. <laughs> Yum.